Hello, my name is Janet and I'm publisher with Elsevier. Medicine Journal is a collection of current reviews for internal medicine training exam revision and continuing professional development. This year, medicine celebrates its 50th anniversary. In honour of this, we've put together a collection of podcasts recorded by the journal's chairman, Albert Farrow. We hope you enjoy them. If you want to find out more about medicine, including how to subscribe, please visit www.medicinejournal.co.uk. Hello, um, welcome to the latest podcast in the Medicine series. I'm Albert Farrow, the editor in chief of the uh, Medicine Journal um, and a clinical pharmacologist at Carson St. Thomas's. I'm delighted to be joined today by uh, Mark Torbett, who's a professor of palliative medicine at Cardiff University. Uh, School of Medicine, um, and also importantly, um, a member of our editorial board as well. So, welcome, Mark. Uh, good oh. to talk to you today. Um, it's very timely that we're talking because the uh, palliative care issue is out this month, December. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, it's uh, it's good to sort of um, have a talk about uh, some of the issues around around palliative care medicine. Really, maybe I could just start by asking you to give us a brief history of, of your your career and how you how you got to where you are and and your and your current roles, really. Yeah, happy to. Um, hi, Albert, and hello from from Cardiff. I'm in my my office at uh, Belindra Cancer Hospital, where I work as a palliative care doctor. Um, brief history. So uh, you might hear from my accent that I'm German. I grew up in Germany. I have a German passport. Uh, now I live in the United Kingdom. Uh, married a, a Welsh lady and live in, in Cardiff. And uh, yeah, I, I've had a sort of mixed career working in general medicine, working in gastroenterology, working in elderly care medicine, uh, actually having a stint in a general practice as well, uh, which was really useful, uh, really, really useful actually for, for what I then later went on to do. Uh, worked in the hospice for some time and then decided I'd um, go for for, for palliative care as a specialty. And um, those were the days when you could um, uh, go in with quite a mixed portfolio of, of SHO jobs. And uh, they actually quite quite liked that and 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 went, went ahead, did my training. I became a consultant. I'm now a clinical director um, and consultant in palliative medicine in Valindra Cancer Hospital and also University Hospital of Landoc, which is um, in Cardiff and Penarth. And I work clinically most of the time. I also have a honorary contract with the university as a professor there and um, flaunt my wares and flaunt the specialty wherever I can, locally, nationally, nationally, and even internationally uh, for Cardiff University. And, you know, we've had some, you know, successes and some failures in, in talking about palliative care uh, and, and what it entails really in, in my time. Yes, yes, very varied career by the by the sounds of it, um, and I think it's probably fair to say that palliative medicine is not a big specialty, is it? Well, it sort of depends how you look at it. As a specialty, no, it's not very big. There's not many of us. You're quite right there. But if just the words palliative care, you know, it's everyone's business. Business, I think it's uh, it's the district nurses' business, it's the GP's business, it's the general physicians' business, and mm. and we specialists in palliative care just sort of scrape the absolute surface of hopefully you know the worst symptoms, the most difficult things, the most challenging things, where you know the uh, general hospital uh, physician says, "I'm really struggling here." We've tried a number of, of things, but this person's nausea is just not going away with the sort of standard management. Or uh, they're so breathless, they're so, so symptomatic with it. We just need some help from the specialists here. So we're small specialty. Um, it's very noticeable now that we're small. Uh, I think, uh, you know, most of my colleagues, nursing colleagues, doctor colleagues and allied healthcare professional colleagues are, are feeling the pressures now. We sort of, you know, in the heydays of being able to spend lots of time with patients, those uh, that's diminishing now, unfortunately, because we have to spread our, ourselves more, more, more thinly, mm. um, and 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 that is tricky. But it's um, yeah, it's it's a small specialty, but with a wider remit. Um, in fact, some people argue that specialists in palliative care ought to be doing education and teaching fifty percent of the time, and only clinical fifty percent of the time. So just to kind of broaden everyone's expertise mm-hmm. in, 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 in 
palliative care. So that's why I'm doing this uh, mm. this uh, podcast with you today, Albert. Indeed. <laughs> I, I mean, it's small, but obviously a very important specialty. Um, and caring for people towards the end of their lives is is something that mm. is obviously extremely important and applies to a lot of uh, other specialties as well. So I think that that is all all um, all very true. And I think uh, historically, it's probably fair to say that palliative medicine has very much been aligned with um, treatment of cancer patients. Mm. But I think, and uh, I'd be interested in your views on this as to whether you think that that role is is getting wider now and whether it should get wider to encompass non-malignant conditions as well yeah absolutely and uh i think i think in cardiff here in particular with my colleagues like dr clear atkinson and various others we've worked very hard on that so that palliative care isn't sort of automatically synonymized with cancer but also with uh, renal failure, heart failure. Um, we work very closely with the cardiology uh, colleagues, for instance, have a really good supportive and palliative care team who work uh, on, on those areas as well. I also like it, the, the fact, Albert, earlier that you said towards the end of life, because I think sometimes people synonymize palliative care with the end of life a little bit too much. Um, as Dr. Catherine Mannix, a retired uh, palliative care consultant, often says, palliative care and end-of-life care are not twins. Mm. They are sort of related siblings, but uh, one is not the same as the other. Um, in fact, she did a, a really good quote, actually, on her on her blog the other day. Let's see if I can find it. I, um, I screenshotted it, so I should have it uh, quickly available. Let's see. Catherine Mannix. Um, it's a pity the meaning of palliative care has become entangled with end-of-life care. Both are very important, but they are not the same thing. Not every dying person needs a palliative care consultation. Not every palliative care patient is dying. And I think I think that's important. So I think our team motto here in the palliative care team in Villindre is that palliative care often get involved from the time of diagnosis onward. Mm-hmm. And that can be quite early, early on. That can be for a heart failure patient. That could be for someone with severe renal problems that can be someone with who's just been diagnosed with breast cancer but has really bad bad symptoms and sometimes what we try and do is do some intensive specialist palliative care management and then we discharge patients which yeah is is, is kind of a newer concept in Mm. in the last sort of five ten years of of palliative care and say here's our details if you need to get in touch again get in touch with us which surprises patients surprises colleagues even more the oncologists go well you're discharging a palliative care patient. What's that all about? Um, but you know, it, it's it. We, we we have to. We're spreading ourselves thin. Get on top of the symptoms, and the patient might actually say, "Oh, I don't need you anymore. Um, the nausea has gone. Great. See you later. You know, if I need you again, I've got your details. Thank you very much." Mm-hmm. I guess that's uh, what you say is very relevant to um, what we're going to be talking about today, which is your particular interest, which is advanced care planning. So here we're really talking about people who are not necessarily at the end of their lives, but may have a a, a terminal condition and they want to uh, make provision for that. So, and I know that's your particular interest, so maybe we'll focus on that. I will just say to to the viewers and and listeners though, that um, the December uh, 2022 issue uh, covers a lot of uh, conditions um, it's the best issue of the year. I mean, it is so good. Um, you, you you probably will want to keep it. You know, absolutely. I mean, you you probably keep all. You probably call, could keep all the issues of medicine, but you need to give this one a special place. Maybe frame it as well. Yes, absolutely. Very well said, Mark. Um, so that covers a lot of uh, treatment of um, various conditions, um, uh, which which cover palliative care. But let's let's go to advanced care planning. Um, and because this is very much your your interest, Mark, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's become my interest. I think, you know, when I was a a medical student many years ago, a I didn't think I'd end up in in palliative medicine, and and b I didn't think that one day I would be the national lead in Wales for DNA CPR and for advanced care planning. In fact, if I'd known that, I probably would have left medical school and just said. No, I'm, I'm I'm not doing that. That's not my future self. But <clears throat> it's surprisingly interesting and varied and multi-professional. So since sort of taking over this sort of advanced future care planning strategy group in Wales, 
um, where, where we sort of look at the DNA CPR policy, look at the uh, other areas like ADRT forms, advanced decisions to refuse treatments and, and forms like, like that. I've met many members of the public, I've met many lawyers and solicitors, I've met people from Health Inspectorate Wales, I've met people from the um, Older People's Commissioner's Office for Wales. I've met, met all sorts of people and it's just really interesting and, and varied what comes in. I've worked very closely with people from the paramedic service, from the ambulance service, and it's it's a really fascinating job and I can't, can't you know, I don't... I don't know if, if if others who are listening to this would would ever sort of want to engage in that sort of thing, but how we sort of prepare people for the end of life is is very interesting, and it's so multifaceted. The good communication, the good discussion. You know, if 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 you or a relative were in hospital and had a sort of terminal condition, then you'd want someone to really communicate that sensitively. And mm. I always say to the junior doctors, if you have a conversation about CPR ceilings of treatment, then it's treated as the most important discussion you have all day. Mm. Uh, and, and try not to have more than two or three of them in the day, because it's just, it is really hard to kind of keep that level of sensitivity really, really focused. Mm. Don't see it as a sort of conveyor belt thing of, oh, every admission with cancer would have to have one of these. No, don't, don't blanket approach this in any shape or form. Individualize it to the individual person mm. and, and always have a trigger in your mind of you know is it likely that this person might die in the next six months and ought to have this conversation you know try and do it in clinic if you possibly can try and do it in a controlled setting actually i often say to my patients look you know you're feeling much better at the moment you've been through a rocky patch it's been really difficult um but um how about now you're feeling better we talk about what happens if you start feeling ill again or, or get worse you know this is the ideal time to discuss this when, you know, you're feeling a, a lot better. And then they say, oh, what do you mean? And I say, well, I want to talk you through things, the options that might happen in the future when out of hours doctor or paramedic might come into your house. And, you know, what would you want to go in for? And, you know, what wouldn't you want to go in for? So I take them through the different options. We've got the treatment ladder approach here where we sort of say, well, would you go in if the GP offered you intravenous antibiotics for chest infection or pneumonia? Yes, of course. Yeah, I would want to do that. Someone else might say, you know, I've had enough. I've been in hospital 20 times in the last year or so. I've absolutely have enough. I never want to go into hospital again, or I never want to go into this and this hospital again. And then I sort of say, but what if you were to fall down the stairs and break your wrist? And then they say, oh, yeah, for that, I would want to go in. Okay, so that's that's a different narrative. So we, we, we talk through through different aspects. And I think when you've got a patient whose cognition is good at the time, you can you can you can talk things through in a, in a, in a really good way, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and prepare things in advance. Mm -hmm. I also say ceilings of treatment. I don't say ceilings of care because I think care should be ceilingless. I mean, mm -hmm. if someone says, oh, we're stopping care at that and that level, I'll say, no, you can always do something extra. You can mm -hmm. make sure someone is comfortable. You can bring someone a cup of tea, you know, and have a chat with them about something. Um, it's not just because the oncologist doesn't want to give any chemotherapy anymore or has said ward level care that there's any ceiling to the care. Maybe there's the ceiling to some of the treatments that we're giving, but not to care. Care is limitless mm -hmm. and we always mm -hmm. want to volunteer and give some of our care. It's, it's interesting and important what you say, I think, isn't it? That, that, um, when we talk about ceilings of treatments and so on, there, there are different scenarios that it, it's worth going through, aren't there? Yeah. Uh, you, you talked about possibly admission for IV antibiotics or admission if you were, if you broke your wrist or whatever. And presumably, those are the sorts of conversations that it's important to have. In this situation, would you want to be treated in that situation? Would you not? And so forth. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think... Um, the complexity, I think, with it is, I think CPR is nearly an easy one in a sense, if you think about it, because once the patient and the relatives have an understanding of the individual success rates of CPR in mm -hmm. people, say, with metastatic cancer, and once they have an understanding of what the procedure involves and what it is, what it's all about, I think they can then have a much more hierarchically similar decision-making process to the doctors. I mean, it's taken me 
years to sort of fully understand all the intricacies of advanced care planning and, and, and DNA CPR. Mm-hmm. But, and how do I convey that knowledge in a good way to someone who's completely new to the topic, who suddenly just says, why the hell is this strange, weird guy, European guy talking to me about resuscitation when I've come into hospital for mm-hmm. antibiotics for pneumonia? Mm-hmm. You know, that, that kind of has to get sort of get through. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think we'd be remiss as doctors if we didn't understand how strange a conversation that must seem or mm-hmm. must be. Mm. I sometimes have conversations where I pat myself on the back and went, that DNA CPR conversation went really well. The patient really sort of said, yeah, fully on board. I'll have IV antibiotics. I'll have IV bloods. I'll have all these different things, but CPR I won't have. And then a day later, I get an angry phone call from the son in Liverpool or the daughter in Edinburgh saying, why the hell did you burden my poor elderly mother with the DNA CPR conversation? I can't believe you did that. Mm-hmm. Of course, the, she's then gotten on the phone and said, yeah, I'm in hospital, I'm being treated, yeah, it's all going okay, I'm having IV antibiotics. Oh, by the way, doctor came and had a chat to me about resuscitation and we decided not to go for resuscitation. And then steam out of ears, basically, what, what is going on? And you know that adds layers of complexity where it's not just the, the person, it's the people around them as well mm-hmm. uh, that makes things, things difficult. I suppose... Because I'm in the front line, I have several of these conversations each each week, probably. Um, I also get more complaints, you know, and I suppose if you were a doctor who didn't want to have any complaints, then you could easily say, well, oh, do you know what? We'll leave it to another day. Maybe someone else can do it. Maybe mm-hmm. someone else can have that conversation. But I think we all need that little bit of clinical bravery to sort of bring up the topic, mm-hmm. get some good ins, get some good mm-hmm. conversation starters for the topic. Mm-hmm. and then. Often I find patients and the families, once everything is on the table, they know the situation, there's actually a form of relief when mm. they understand what can be done and what probably oughtn't to be done. Mm. There's an initial bad reaction and then two days or three days later, they often say, yeah, we needed that conversation. I didn't enjoy it. It's not my favorite thing, but we did need to talk about that. And like when I wrote my will, I feel better now because I've kind of got a few things in order and we've talked about a few things. So you brought up a, a, a situation where you've had the conversation with the patient, but not necessarily with the relative, and the relatives uh, got a bit upset about it all. Um, and I think we've all, we've all been there. I want to put a, another scenario to you. Suppose there's a conflict between what the patient wants and what the next of kin or other relatives want. You know, the patient says, enough's enough. You know, I don't want anything more. But uh, let's say their nearest and dearest think that we should be doing a lot more so there's a conflict there how do how does one handle that it happens happens a fair bit i mean i wouldn't say it happens all the time but it it happens it happens quite a lot um i think usually you find that there's an information mismatch there and that the, the 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 people who who perhaps made some remote decisions haven't had the, they have, maybe haven't got the full picture. Um, my advice always to team members and various others, I was on call over, over the weekend, basically, uh, and, and in the hospice, we had a few conundrums, and my advice is always to go back to the patient bedside uh, and, and to speak and to get the relatives in and to speak and to phone the relatives and be quite forward acting and proacting. Don't cogitate on doing it, just do it. Just talk to the people, have conversations, be, ang- be honest, uh, actually introduce your honesty and say, I'm going to be very frank today. Is that okay with you? And you can then quickly see, I think 95% of people will say, yes, please, I want you to be frank. Others might be a bit more reticent, a bit fearful of what, what you're going to say. So they might put a stopper to it. And, and then I can kind of go through the whole picture and I kind of give people sort of an understanding of what happens. Mm. And then only then is it actually quite rare that there's still a sort of information, there's a still a sort of a, a disparity I find between what people feel ought to be done. Um, sometimes there still is. And then I'm afraid to say the patient trumps. Trump may be the wrong word here. Um, the patient patient's view kind of takes, I, I think, a, a bit of a priority. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes I have to be clear with a relative about that. Sometimes it's one relative and all the other relatives say, oh, actually, no, I think we, we need a bit more of a 
gentler care approach doesn't mean they can't have radiotherapy or chemotherapy or all the other things but that one you know you know we we don't want that one act final act or whatever you want to call it uh and the one other relative still says oh i've read about these dnr forms in the daily mail it means they won't have anything else no that's not the case it's really not the case anymore hmm. and i actually want to say that uh, a lot of people in their decision making and reasoning on DNA CPR forms, it's some sort of uh, label that you won't get better, any any good care. And I really don't see that. I don't really don't see that. I think uh, perhaps that was a sort of thing in the past and that perhaps there's some research from the past that sort of indicates in that direction. But when you speak to anyone, certainly my colleagues in NHS Wales and various areas, they know that a DNA CPR form is not is specific to the condition that is written at the top of the form such as a metastatic lung cancer with metastases to the ribs, and it's specific to that decision only. And it um, doesn't mean that a CPR, uh, um, it, it means it's only CPR that is uh, not recommended or, or, or information about and not other procedures. And I think most people know that. And I, I think that's one of the messages I, I would want to get across. I guess you alluded to this earlier, the fact that um, many health professionals might not want to have these conversations. It might be difficult. Um, they'll kick it down the road or somebody else, or somebody else will do it or that sort of thing. But um, somebody needs to have that conversation. But sometimes I guess the patients and all the relatives don't want to have that conversation. Um, and in that case, you can't really sort of force these uh, conversations on them, can you? No. What do you feel about that? And, and can you, is it legitimate to make decisions about uh, care towards the end of life without having had the conversation with the patient and all the relatives? I mean, you, you can. I, I, I think it shouldn't become common practice. But um, when, when I sort of feel myself walk forward in a consultation or if I give a warning shot that it's about to happen, and I sometimes do that in the clinic before the next clinic, so I'll say, okay, you know, next clinic, we're going to discuss something uh, involving treatments that you might want and that you might not want in, in, in the future, including some of the harsher treatments that I feel don't work. Uh, a, are you happy for us to discuss that at the next, the next time? Maybe you want to bring your husband in um, and then we'll have a conversation about it together because these things are not always easy. Um, are you okay to do that? And most people will say, yeah, happy to do that um, and, and talk about that. And then that's a bit of a warning shot. And we haven't actually said anything at that point, but they know, okay, this is going to be a serious talk and a serious discussion, and then they can bring their relative in, basically. Um, if, I mean, so, and then I, I usually feel my way forward into the consultation, say, look, this is a topic that some people don't particularly find easy to discuss. And I'm, I'm nearly always honest, I say, I, I always get little bit of the flutters as well when I discuss this because I don't know how people are going to react to it because what I'm going to talk about is what happens when you get less well and towards the, the end of life. And I don't know when that is, but it's a topic that I feel is important that we do discuss about. And then you can really start seeing whether people want to stop and hold it there or whether they're happy to continue. I'd say 99% want to continue and talk about it and they find it quite important and perhaps no one's ever given them the in to kind of talk about it and the relative to hear their views and thoughts basically through a, a, a medium, which is me. Um, and maybe 1% then say, no, I don't want to talk about it. And then I build into my consultation various stops to say, are you okay to continue or should we just stop it here, completely stop it here? So I build that in every second or third sentence. Mm. The patient says, stop doing that. It's annoying. Just keep, keep talking. Um, you know, yeah. but I kind of build in safety nets so that the patient feels in, in control. Yeah. Whilst all the while you, you sort of have to convey some of the important information. So CPR in certain circumstances like um, metastatic cancer, if you have a cardiac arrest, um, is successful in maybe 1.8, 1.9% of cases. So 1.8, 1.9% of cases leave hospital after receiving CPR. Oh, okay, that's interesting. What does the procedure involve? Electric shocks to the bare chest, compressions, um, insertion of airways, administration of medications, sometimes in a 
in, an, in a setting like an outpatient setting or a hospital setting, et cetera, et cetera, electric shocks and, and various other things. Oh, okay. What can it cause? Well, th- that procedure, if, if successful, uh, but it can cause internal bleeding, it can cause brain damage. When If you come back from the procedure and survive, you may not be the same person you were before. You know, are you okay to continue with this? I, are you all right with this? I mean, it's a difficult thing to talk about, but are you happy to continue? And, and then we sort of, we, we, we talk it through. And then, yeah, I think, I think then people get a sort of level of, of understanding perhaps of, of, of what it is. Mm-hmm. Then I make it clear that it's not something that um, will preclude them from any other treatment whatsoever. Um, I give them resources. I give them videos to watch or information resources or patient information leaflets, whatever they prefer. Some people hate patient information leaflets and they don't find them easy to read or they're dyslexic. And so they would prefer to watch a video uh, and maybe show that video to the family. So we've, we've got different methods of how we, how we, how we tackle this. We've got this, um, um, we've got this little um, sort of cardboard booklet here, which you sort of open up um, and then you press some of the buttons and, 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 and then the videos play. Okay. And then, to get to the, the, the talk CPR videos, so that's something I can easily take into the the, the clinic area, and we we made five hundred of these basically. So we distributed them to GP practices all across Wales, or I can give them a, a QR code. So you can see one of those QR codes in the background there, um, and and they sort of hang on the walls that directly link you to to videos about the topic of DNA CPR. So you have these conversations with people, you sort of introduce them very gently and, and and sometimes you say, have you had enough of that discussion today? Do you want me to come back and talk to you about this one again? Uh, and or, or not. And some people are really happy to talk about it. And then the relative is there as well and they, they talk it through. Sometimes they might be a bit upset, but then I offer support. And then I often also say, well, you know, we've had this discussion today. It's also important that we put it on a, in writing on a piece of paper. And that is one of the you know dreaded DNA CPR forms, but I want to give you that form. In Wales, the top copy of the form is given to the patient and the relatives and they take it home. And the, the sort of copy of the form is left in the healthcare records and then distributed to the GP or the palliative care community nurse and, and various others basically. But that's also an important stop, a step is that you actually say, you know, we need to make sure that is communicated and that the paramedic who comes to the house knows that this form is there at home with you, basically. So lots of different aspects, mm. lots of different strands. Yes, it can be distressing, but sometimes when you've got practice in it and you do it often, then it's it's something that you you can do. But just a, a quick one. So you said you mentioned also, and I'd mentioned before, the colleagues who might push the conversation to the, maybe the next time or another colleague who don't really want to have it. I mean, I do understand it. And I had a conversation in a pub, actually, um, in, in Cardiff with a, a neuro-oncologist, basically, a neuro-oncologist colleague. And he said, you know what, the problem I sometimes have is I don't, I wouldn't have a, a, a problem with some of the, the DNA CPR conversations, but my job often is involves three or four items of bad news in a clinic. So we'll discuss a scan. And then we'll discuss the prognosis and we'll discuss some other aspects like the kidney function. And all of it is quite bad news. And then the fourth whammy, Mark, of having a DNA CPR discussion is sometimes too much for the patient. And I'm nearly feeling like I'm inflicting some physical abuse on the patient, some physical harm. Hmm. And I say, no, you don't, you can't do it then. You really can't do it. You have to maybe bring them in again, have a further conversation about it. Mm-hmm. And so you have questioned earlier about are there any circumstances where you don't discuss it, where the patient maybe calls a halt or or you a fear harm might be done from the conversation. Those are the instances where you can sort of not say that. You can sort of have, make a DNA CPR decision as a team, ideally as a multidisciplinary team, but you could, could write on the form it will cause harm if I discuss this with the patient. They've made it very clear that they do not want a discussion on this and that they will actually suffer psychological or physical harm. Mm. Um, but I have discussed it with the husband, with the patient's consent. Uh, they are sort of 
understanding of it and they will take the form home and keep it but you know they won't show it to the individual often the individual understands that this transaction has happened but they just don't want to go into the detail hmm. and the tracy versus adam brooks court case a number of years ago which you may be aware of talked about only in rare circumstances when the clinician feels actual harm may be done from having a dna cpr conversation then you can still make the DNA CPR decision, but you don't have to explicitly tell the patient. But of course, you know, ideally you have to tell the, the people around the patient, the next of kin, the, the significant other, you know, so there's often no way around having a difficult conversation. It just has to happen with someone. Mm. And I suppose the paramount thing is it all has to be done with sensitivity. Yeah, absolutely. Talk. Yeah, that's right. It's it's yeah. it's uh, it's a very important and fascinating subject, Mark. Um, mm. Thank you very much for discussing that today. There's there's more about this in in a specific um, chapter in in our issue. Um, mm. Lots more besides. So uh, as we said before, we'll uh, direct our, our listeners and our viewers to uh, December 22, 2022, mm. where you can read about this and much more. Mark, it's been a pleasure, and thank you very much for taking part in this uh, conversation today. Absolutely. And thank you very much, Albert. It's been, it's been great fun.